Grab a cigar and some Saurian brandy while we talk about Picard's season opener in this week's Initial Cards. We're talking today about the first episode of Picard's second season, The Stargazer. I'll be throwing a Q continuum worth of spoilers out if you'd prefer to snap your fingers on out of here. There's no other way to say it, this is easily the best episode so far in the modern era of Trek. We're dropped into an intro that we'll circle back to in the final third of the script, where Starfleet officers are throwing themselves at a Borg Queen on the bridge of a ship Rios is in command of, even though he tells them to stand down. I've got the first like for the new intro sequence. It's still the theme of fractured falling glass, but it's new, and the theme's been reorchestrated. Does this particular shot remind anyone of the MPC from Tron? I love the Broken Things story these credits seem to portray. We're then taken back to Chateau Picard, where we find out Picard has other, what I used to call, indentured servant Romulan grape pickers working for him. It turns out they don't pick the grapes, those are harvested by transporter. And I've got a like for seeing a smidge of vineyard life, and the contrast to last season where Picard was present but didn't seem to care whether the grapes turned out or not. He now seems more confident and full of life, which I guess at more than 90 when you get a brand new android body, that makes sense. We find out that his mailhouse Carl Yaver has died, and in this we date the season to at least two years after the start of season one, and we're officially into the 25th century. I've got a like for this whole conversation with Laris, in which it seems the two may share some feelings of love for each other. A straightish man knows he's found the right woman when she can find things of his she's never laid eyes on. It's such a poor model, I can't tell if the gold ship on Picard's bookshelf is a constitution or ambassador class. It's got the nacelles like the constitution, but deflector and saucer closer to an ambassador. Anyway. Picard starts having these dreams about his mother, and we're left with the impression that his father was abusive to her. But we get to see one of the actual pieces of falling glass from the intro. Really nice tie-in. I've got a like for Picard giving a Space the Final Frontier speech at Starfleet Academy, where he's now Chancellor. He calls Elnor out for being the first Romulan in Starfleet. Seems kinda weird for a Romulan ninja nun to be in Starfleet, and not just part of Picard's Romulan entourage, but a pretty cool honor in the grand scheme of Trek. During this speech, he talks about some of his family and brings up an ancestor that explored the solar system named Rene, which we can assume his now deceased nephew is named after. We find out Seven of Nine has taken over La Serena and is transporting medical supplies for the Fenris Rangers, though she kept the Rios holograms, and I have a like for the tactical hologram helping her clean up some raiders trying to steal her cargo. Awesome comic relief, and just all around, I love the Rios holograms. I can't recommend the book Rogue Elements enough. I'm not the biggest fan of Trek in literature, but you learn the origins of La Serena and how the holograms all came to be Rios. When we check in on Gerardi and Soji, I've got one single dislike for this episode. Soji seems like she's written into the script as an afterthought. She looks absolutely stunning in the one scene she gets, but she's the only main character we come back to that isn't really developed at all. We learn through this, though, that Gerardi spent some of the last few years hooked up with Rios, who's now captain of a modern stargazer. Still the four-nacelle design, though, which I have a like for. I guess you can smoke cigars on the bridge of a Starfleet ship if you're the captain. Going back to Raffi, who's with Picard in the Academy, she only gets restated at her previous rank, but Rios gets a promotion. Must have burned one too many bridges in her drinking herself to death days. At the end of season one, the internet lost its mind over her and Seven holding hands, which I thought was just two broken people bonding as they make themselves less broken. I have a like for it turning out that they kind of do have a thing for each other, but Seven has too much to do to settle down with Raffi in the desert. I've got a like for the scene where Elnor is assigned to a ship, and Raffi to the same one. We find out there's a USS Hakaru Sulu, which is splendid callback to Uncle George. More than that, the ship Elnor and Raffi are assigned to is the USS Excelsior, the first ship Sulu captained. 
When you hear that, you think it's probably just a new ship with the same name, like the Stargazer, whose Remembrance Hollow is seen in the background. But later in the episode, we see a fleet of different Federation ships, including what looks like a classic Excelsior-class ship. Is the original NX-2000 Excelsior still in service? During this scene, Picard also name-drops Spock to Elnor as someone to look to as inspiration. Since he was one of the first Vulcans in Starfleet, and racist folks like Bones had a lot of xenophobic comments for. I've got a like for the scene where Picard goes to see Guinan. Since she's a universe shift barometer, I didn't think we'd see her until after the crew shifted universes. And even though Picard doesn't go to see her for some great purpose or specific advice, she once again proves that Guinan is the most wise and understanding recurring character across all of Trek. Though I do find the concept that Alorians only age if they want to kind of strange. There's use of Saurian brandy that goes all the way back to the first aired episode of Trek here, though. An admiral comes to tell Picard the news that an anomaly that the Stargazer is observing is literally crying out his name in space, and even though he's not a hands-on admiral anymore, he's got to go take care of this. Too bad it wasn't delivered by Admiral Sheer f Hubris, but he leaves immediately and doesn't have time to say goodbye to Laris. I've got a like for when Picard reaches the Stargazer, and it's an amazing contrast to the first episodes of Season 1, where young Starfleet officers didn't know or care who he was, and now random officers give him the full Admiral on Deck treatment. When Picard reaches the bridge and attempts to communicate, a Borg vessel that looks like the Queen's personal detachable Unimatrix comes out of the anomaly. They claim to have an overture of peace, but force their way onto the ship, and we see that the self-destruct codes are still as simplistic in the 25th century as they were in the 23rd. Just when you think it's all over before it began for our heroes, Picard wakes up in the shattered atrium of a chateau, old and confused. Which I guess is just every day for him. He finds his former Romulan workers gone and replaced by one of the creepy synths that destroyed Utopia Planitia on Mars. I've got one final like for the deep fake of Q matching Picard by getting older. A couple of things about this scene I find puzzling. Does Picard actually remember blowing himself and other main characters up? He cusses Q out, but it appears Q just saved his life. Again. Like in my personal favorite episode of Trek, Tapestry. Q harkens back to how the trial of humanity never ends. So is this another Q-initiated test? Or is this Q giving Picard his second, I mean third, or is it fourth? No, fifth chance for life. I guess we'll find out in this season that's been masterfully set up so far. Still not sure where they actually are, or what time travel will do for them, but we'll find out over the next nine weeks. So much great contrast to season one in this episode, and so many great callbacks to all kinds of Trek's past. My video highlighting this week's discovery will come out soon, and I can't wait to see next week's Picard. Thanks for tuning in. I've been your host, Dustin Wing.